The psalmist says, Weeping may spend the night, but joy comes in the morning. Early Sunday morning, the dark settling over the garden, a chill in the air. Mary Magdalene, eyes swollen by crying for days, goes to the garden tomb and sees there that the stone has been rolled away from the mouth of the tomb. And she stands there at the tomb weeping. Inside, there is no Jesus. Inside, there is that bare slab. Inside, there are angels, two angels, one at the head and one at the foot. And they ask her, Woman, why are you weeping? Is it an obvious? She must have asked herself. Mary Magdalene, this follower of Jesus, this woman from whom he delivered her of seven demons, this Mary Magdalene, who watched him suffer just two days earlier, three days earlier, this Mary Magdalene who saw him nailed to the cross, who saw him die there, a long, agonizing death, who saw him buried, who saw that stone rolled over the mouth of the garden tomb. Mary Magdalene is weeping because Jesus is no more. And now she can't find the body. He's missing. And so she says to the angels. And just then, she turns. She turns and what must be this blaze of light. She sees only an outline. She can't make out who it is. She thinks it's the gardener. That would be logical. And he says, woman, why are you weeping? And she tells him what she has told the angels. And then he asks, what are you looking for? And then he says, Mary. Just one word. He says her name. And instantly, in her hearing that name, she recognizes him. He is no stranger. He is the risen Jesus, somehow he is alive and right there standing in front of her. And she feels a surge of life. She feels that she has been raised with him from death to new life. And he says, go, don't hang on to me. As natural as that is, who among us would not throw our arms around a loved one whom we have buried, but who suddenly appears? I know if my mother or my father appeared, I would throw my arms around them. I would never want to let them go. That has to be what Mary is feeling, that sense of just clinging to this man she loves, clinging to the one who saved her life, clinging to the one who showed her abundant life as her rabbi, her teacher in the way of life. Don't cling to me, Mary, he says. Go, go and tell the others what you have heard and what you have seen. And off she runs to tell the other disciples, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. And they will see him too. They will see him that night. He will appear in their midst. And they will keep on seeing him again and again and again. Because, because evil and sin and death and the devil, they have no power. That power has been defeated by God on the third day in raising his son. 
from that garden tomb and giving him that life that is undying, that is eternal. Mary knows that those words of the prophet Isaiah have been fulfilled, and she has seen that fulfillment. She knows that God has swallowed up death in victory. And God dries her tears. And where Mary is weeping no more, weeping may spend the night, but joy comes in the morning. Kate Bowler is weeping at the tomb. Kate tells her story in a memoir. And the memoir describes this journey that this follower of Jesus has been on. It's called Everything Happens for a Reason. Who among us hasn't said that to himself or herself at one point? Everything happens for a reason. That's the title of the book, and it's subtitled, And Other Lies I've Loved. She tells her story. She describes how she was the architect of her life. She had everything planned. She was on an upward trajectory of success. She was married. She and her husband had a young child. She had a great career. She was, she is, on the faculty of Duke Divinity School and teaches the history of Christianity. She had just had a book published. She was finally there. And then the phone rang one afternoon in her office, and she answered, and it was her doctor. She had gone to see him complaining of stomach pains, and he had examined her and then sent her for tests, and she had received, or he had received the test results and was reporting the same to her. It was not gallbladder at all, not that kind of problem at all. It was a bigger problem, a greater challenge. He said, you have stage four cancer. This woman, age 35, was told that her life might very well come to an end much sooner than she ever anticipated, that she might not see her four-year-old grow up and marry and have children. And she describes how, at that moment, she collapsed in tears because this life that she had planned, she was the architect of her life, was no more. It would never be as it had been. And she wept. She called her husband. He came over. The two held on to one another. Who wouldn't? And they wept together. She describes this life, this new life of hers, in this memoir of hers. And she describes how even in the midst of this dire diagnosis, she encountered the risen Christ. She knew for herself the power of the resurrection She believes, this follower of Jesus, that God will make a way where there is no way. She says that she has a sense now that God is present in the everyday. In a way, she writes, she says, I didn't always imagine. In the worst moments of my life, 
I'm thrown into a constant hospital world of anxious looks on everybody's faces, everyone's face, and a sense of looming despair. And I realize that the new world I was living in was a place where God lived in somehow. And I honestly couldn't quite figure out, I couldn't figure out what is this weird peace, this peace that comes from Jesus, this risen Christ. And we hear about that in the second reading today. What is this sense that God is present in the people who are visiting me? I think of God's presence now as a place I visit, a place I was introduced to in the worst moments of my life, a place I have to cultivate. She describes in this book, she describes in interviews how she has learned more about life because of this illness, how she has come to see the importance of community, how necessary she now knows it is to have people, fellow believers, who uphold her, who pray for her, who cook food for her and bring it to her, who, who are there to show that, that care, which is Christ. She writes about how she has discovered some profound empathy, empathy that she didn't have before for people who are suffering and a real concern for them. She writes about how life has changed, how even how life is even brighter now. She says, the part that precedes resurrection is death. And part of the beauty of living to the end is the part where you end and God begins. And you can say the best part about me is not me. It's the new thing that God is always doing. I'm still baffled, she says, still baffled that this terrible time has been the most important time of my life, that everything now feels brand new in the midst of decay and the terrible, this terrible hospital world and needles. There was always, there is always this sense that God can make things new. God can make things new. Weeping may spend the night, but joy comes in the morning. In your life, you may be weeping for a lot of different reasons. Weeping because you have a broken relationship with someone you love, and reconciliation seems impossible. Weeping because you've been told some terrible news about your health or terrible news about the health of someone you love. Weeping maybe because you have someone close to you who's slipping away into that darkness, which is the loss of memory. Weeping for the world. Weeping at the headlines of injustice and oppression of people who are vulnerable, weeping at the violence, not just on the streets anymore, but now tragically, worryingly, even in classrooms. This Wednesday at 6.01 in the evening, I'll be here at Christ Church, and I'll ring that bell five times as a way of remembering that 50 years ago on Wednesday, Dr. Martin Luther King was killed.
by an assassin. This man, this man who gave his life as a witness to justice and freedom and peace, not just for African Americans, but for all human beings, who had a vision for what America could be, the beloved community, a Christian community, a community built on the love of Christ. His work is undone. And it's ours to do as the followers of Jesus, as what one theologian describes as agents of resurrection. The good news is, the good news that Kate Bowler proclaims, the good news that Mary Magdalene proclaims, the good news is that God has swallowed up death in victory, that Jesus has risen from the grave, that Jesus has conquered every enemy that we will ever face in this world, that enemy of sin, that enemy who is the evil one, that enemy which is death itself. As blessed St. Paul puts it, as he describes our Christian hope, the center, at the center of our lives as the followers of Jesus is the good news, is the hope that there is nothing in this world. However bad life might be, challenging, however dark it might be, there is nothing in this world that will ever separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus. Not even death, because God has put to death, death, and we are people of the resurrection. Weeping may spend the night, but for us who believe in Jesus, for us who follow Jesus, joy comes in the morning. May you know that joy. May we know that joy. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen.